Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Refining Rhetoric. Today, our guest is Jim Hodges. He has his own audiobook company and two moments of his life. One, a question by his wife, and one, a comment by his teacher, changed the trajectory of what this man has accomplished on earth and made it so he has blessed hundreds of thousands of homeschoolers and students around the globe. Without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Classical Conversation Studios presents Refining Rhetoric with CEO Robert Portens, a podcast where faith, business, politics, and classical education meet. Join us as we use the classical tools of rhetoric to seek truth in every arena of life. Jim is the founder and president of Jim Hodges Audiobooks, a beloved resource among families around the world. You can purchase them through our bookstore. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Robert. Good to be here. Jim, you and your wife began homeschooling in the 1980s, so you are one of the pioneers. And uh, just want to know, what was it like uh, going out on a branch at that time? Probably not many people around homeschooling like they are today. Uh, what was that like? Uh, frightening, actually, <laughs> because <laughs> we were stepping into a very much unknown territory. Neither Monica nor I were homeschooled. Neither one of us were, you know, like trained professional educators or anything like that. Uh, we got the typical questions that most families at that time got. Is that legal? Uh, what about socialization? Uh, are you qualified to do that? You know, all of that kind of stuff. But my wife in particular was just bound and determined that that was her calling, that that's what she was supposed to do. So I kind of acquiesced at the beginning. I was not a fan of the idea. So I said, okay, we've got three kids. Right. We, uh, we can homeschool one of them for one year, and then we'll take another look at it. And by Christmas of that year, we pulled both of our kids out and that were in school at that time. And, and right. although we, we may have looked back once or twice, um, we ended up uh, graduating all three of them from high school as homeschooling parents. Yeah. Well, if you go to your favorite search engine today and look up homeschooling resources, you'll find a thousand different companies who are happy to sell you any, any sort of thing. But that wasn't, well, Google wasn't around back then, but <laughs> what was it like putting together curriculum uh, uh, back then? Your obviously your options were a little bit more limited than than they are today. We had uh, Weaver, we had Konos, we had uh, Bob Jones, we had a Becca. You know, there were a few there were a few options out there, and we kind of grabbed you know this and that that seemed to fit for us. I know we used Konos for uh, kind of like the framework, uh, but we definitely used. The Weaver booklets, we used Bob Jones for math, you know, so there was stuff available, but my goodness, I would, I, I would be uh, frightened, I think, to be a brand new homeschooler today with the, with the unbelievable variety of options that are available to parents. It's a great thing, but I can imagine it being very overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's why at Classical Conversations, we try to bring the best curriculum to you as as parents. What was it like? You're a Navy man. Uh, you started homeschooling when you were in the Navy. Was there additional challenges, the fact that you were a government employee in, in the military uh, and trying to homeschool? Actually, no, because um, it gave us a great excuse for our family members who were not thrilled with our decision to homeschool their nieces and nephews and grandchildren by saying, look, you know, they we move every few years. You're always putting kids in a school and back out of school. So we just think it would be the best thing to have things consistent across the board without without all that back and forth. So it actually worked to our benefit in that regard. And despite their their initial uh, objections to our decision, within you know two or three years. Um, uh, siblings and parents and aunts and uncles alike were like, okay, you guys made the right decision. Your kids are really turning out pretty awesome. So we were very, you know, but that was, that was very mm, gratifying to us 
and um, co confirming our decision that other people were actually seeing the benefit. We thought we thought it was there, but um, it was nice to hear other people say the same thing. Yeah, I kind of remember my grandparents being uh, a little hesitant at first uh, when we were being homeschooled, and then as we were growing up, like, yeah, we always supported them. I'm like, oh, I remember <laughs> you always supporting my mom and dad. <laughs> okay, well, we can all alter alter our memories, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they just felt it was constructive criticism and questioning yeah. early on. And and you know what, frankly. Um, I, at the time, I, I genuinely appreciated their concerns. They were legitimate. They were legitimate right. concerns. And so that kind of gave us uh, more motivation to, to do our best at it. Obviously, there are kids. Of course, we want to do our best with them and their education. But to know that other people were kind of looking at like, okay, yeah, let's, let's make sure that we do this right. Let's not be, you know, slough off on things. So it was a good motivation for us. Now, like most people, you left the Navy and started an audiobook company. I did. <laughs> How did that happen? Uh, um, quite by accident, actually. Um, I had always enjoyed uh, reading out loud. I did it when I was in school, elementary school, middle school, high school. I always volunteered to read out loud. I did theater. I volunteered at church to be a lector. Um, I sang solos, so I was always kind of in a performing mode since I was very young, like seven or eight was the first time I read out loud in front of my class, and my teacher was like, oh my goodness, Jim, you did a great job, would you Would you read some more? Well, I was, I was <laughs> hooked at that moment, <laughs> seriously. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know what a, what a trajectory turning point that was, that one comment that she gave me was really life-altering. But anyway, my wife. My, about a about a year before I was going to retire, my wife and I were out at uh, Cracker Barrel on a date night, and she said, um, "You know, what are you what are you going to do next? What have you got planned for after the Navy?" And I told her a couple of things that I had in mind, and she said, "Well, let me change the question. I think maybe you misunderstood it. So let me be a little more clear. If you could do anything you wanted for a job and it would pay right. the bills, what would that be?" I said, "I'd record books." She said, okay, I've known you for 20 years. We've been married for 19. I've never heard you mention this before. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I'm a guy. I have these dream things in the back of my head that I never figure are actually going to happen. And she said, well, why don't we try that? So the next day we went out and checked out books from the library on cassette, of course, and I thought, well, I can do as good as that. Oh, I can do way better than that guy. And so we just decided, let's do that. And uh, Jim Hodges Audiobooks was born within, you know, six months of that day. No, I think that's really cool how that one teacher impacted your entire life uh, in, that, in that way. Have you ever been able to go back and, and reach out to her? Or do you remember her name? Or you just kind of remember being a young student and getting that positive feedback? I'm, I'm guessing I was probably in second grade. It could have been first grade because it was a Dick and Jane book. I mean, come on, how many, how hard is it to read a Dick and Jane book? But I knew at that time that an exclamation point at the end of a sentence meant this is exciting. So it was yeah. run, Dick, run. So that's the way I read it because that's the way I heard it in my head. And so she was very, you know, instead of the other kids, run, Dick, run, see, Dick, you know, I, yeah. I actually brought life to it. And so she just, anyway, she encouraged me tremendously just by that one positive comment. So you started on cassette tapes. Is that right? I did. Yes, I did. Yes. How, what was the challenges with that compared to all the technology today? Um, the, the primary challenge was cost. Um, eight cassettes in the, you know, the, the white clamshell cases with the slide in art and, and, you know, that was, that was a very expensive product in the raw. When I got it in my hand, it was already costing me quite a bit of money. So my retail price went up dramatically because I had to, I had to recoup my expenses and get some, get some pay back. Um, I was limited to 800 minutes because a cassette can only handle 50 minutes per side. So that limited the length of the book that I could do. I 
completely s skipped regular CDs and went straight from cassette to MP3 file format CD. And that too was a cost decision. Multiple CDs were even more expensive than the cassettes, whereas a single CD in the MP3 format was something that I could afford. And I was able to lower my prices for my customers because my acquisition cost went way down. So it was, but you know, obviously you're keeping up with technology, you know, um, nobody had cassette players anymore. They all had CD players in the car and now they don't even have CD players in the car. So we're, we're transitioning yet again. <laughs> yeah. We're doing that same thing at classical conversations. We haven't officially, uh, phased out all of our CDs products, but we know that the market is going to do that for us because the minivans, the families are buying now simply don't have CD players in them. So we've seen the sales kind of go down significantly over the last few years. So we're just wondering when the end will be on CDs. Good question. I think um, um, probably streaming and downloads is what you're left with now for audio because it's so easy for people. Everybody's got a mobile device. It's called their phone. What, um, starting out, like how did you get the rights to read these books? Like it's a whole entire process. You can't just go pick up you know, the latest thriller and read it and sell a copy of it. Can you? That no, 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 you cannot. If it's a, if it is under copyright protection, obviously you have to contact the copyright owner. You have to get permission. You have to pay royalties. They get to say, I don't like the way you recorded this line. And so I record very, very few um, copyright material. And when I do, it's because somebody's hired me to record it and they like my voice already. And I sent them a sample and said, look, if you hire me, this is what it's going to sound like. And they write back and say, yeah, that sounds good. So that's not been an issue. When I started, I would record only out of copyright materials. And at that time, if it was copyright before if, uh, in 1923 or earlier, then it was public domain and I could do anything I wanted with it. So I started with the Henty novels because they were clearly in the public domain at that time. The, um, I mean, the Henty novels cover a, a wide variety of subjects and topics. Was there a favorite one early on or was there a bestseller from uh, when you first got started? My bestseller probably of all time is the first one I ever did, which is with Lee in Virginia, which tells the story of the American Civil War or the War of Northern Aggression, depending on where you live. Uh, it tells the story. We like um, to call it, uh, I think it's in our history timeline, we tie it to Lincoln, so the Lincoln's War Lincoln's War. States. With the war between the states, right, right. So, I, I, I actually intentionally chose that because I thought, let's see, homeschoolers are a bunch of rebels. They'll probably like this one. <laughs> so, <laughs> I recorded that first, and uh, man, about ten years later, I did an analysis to see what you know, which one of my uh, titles were selling best. And in that 10 year period, I had sold on average one copy of With Lee in Virginia every single day for 10 years. I sold many, many, many. So it's probably still my best seller. Um, I don't think it's my best recording personally because it was the first one I ever did. I think I've gotten better as time's gone on. Um, but it, it's a very good seller, that's for sure. Now, you're in an industry where technology changes. Uh, pretty regularly compared to other other industries. What has that been like for you as you've um, needed to move rec previous recordings onto new technology? Do you just start over again, or is there a way to get a tape into an MP3 into a streaming service? Well, I already um, had saved electronic editions of every single recording I ever did. You know, I've got an external hard drive with all of my recordings on it, and, there, and I've got close to 100 right now. And so when MP3 became the model, you know, you get a there's, a, there's programs that will convert a WAV file or a CDA, you know, .CDA audio file and it'll convert it over to MP3 and you don't really have to do anything. You just tell it, you know, convert this. And so going from 
cassettes to MP3 was relatively easily easy for me, technologically speaking. And then I then I put them on my website as downloads. And to, to do a test run, I said, look, you know, this this title over here, A Knight of the White Cross, I, I'm going to try out my new download service to see if it works. So for one month, you know, you can get you can download this one for 10 bucks. And I sold, you know, 200 copies of it very quickly. Um, and so it's like, OK, great. So now I went to downloads and I and now I have offered my complete inventory to you know, just about all of the streaming and audiobook sites as well, as well as Classical Conversations, which I would encourage people to buy from Classical Conversations. <laughs> but that's just well, me. Thank you. We, we appreciate that. ClassicalConversationsBooks.com if you want to go get the audio version of any of these novels and other uh, readings. You know, what? how did you find G.A. Henty and, like, what made you choose him? It was not copywritten, but... right. Did you just do a search for not copywritten, not historical no, novels, no. or actually, um, you know, we were homeschooling still. We lived in uh, Oklahoma at the time. We had a lot of friends who were homeschooling their kids. Virtually, our entire church body was homeschooling their kids. And I just started asking around. I said, "Look, I would really like to start an audiobook business, and I'm looking for an author that's out of copyright, honestly, but I want books that will inspire young men." to godly manhood. That really was my primary motivation. And everybody said, Henty, 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 Henty. I'd never heard of him, honestly, at that point. And so I went to a friend of mine, Ruby Reeves, who was selling the books. And I said, Ruby, you know, pick out five good ones for me. And so I bought the books from her and I read a couple of them and I came back to her and I said, are they, are they all like this? She said, yeah, they're all like that. I said, oh my gosh, I have found my author. He wrote 122 books. He's out of copyright protection. He's historically accurate, and I'm a history nut. Yeah, and they you know they take place around the world throughout world history, and uh, the hero characters are like every mother's dream son. So <laughs> I felt like he was firing on all cylinders for what I wanted to do as a dad, as, as a businessman, as a Christian, as a homeschooling dad. I just thought this is the perfect the perfect author for me. Um, for for what I see uh, for Jim Hodges audiobooks, and he's proven to be. I've got thirty five of his books now, so that means I only have what ninety more to go or something. I mean, yeah. uh, there's, there's a lot more out there uh, that I have not recorded, but they are fantastic books. They really are. Hey, have you ever wanted to hear from Lee Bortons herself uh, why she loves so many of these books? Well, you should consider joining her in her weekly book club called The Words Aptly Spoken Book Club. It's hosted every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, and each week's meeting centers around a discussion of a new book, including Classical Conversations exclusives, like selections from the Copper Lodge Library series, as well as literary classics like The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Mere Christianity. You do not have to read these books beforehand. You can join in without having read them and engage in thought-provoking conversation on the power held by words, ideas, and stories with other homeschoolers, parents, and lovers of books. Visit LeeBortons.com to find a live link to join the Words Aptly Spoken Book Club. That's LeeBortons.com, L-E-I-G-H-B-O-R-T-I-N-S.com. See you there. What would be the number one thing you've learned uh, throughout these recordings? Because obviously you're reading things for the first time. You haven't read all these books before. What, is there some life lesson that really stands out uh, from uh, this work that you've done that's been so vital to the preservation and the, um, you know, just continuing uh, making these available to families? One thing that I've learned is that we don't learn from history. We keep doing the same stupid things over and over and over. I'm sorry. I mean, we do. Yeah. We don't. That's the one thing that I've learned from history is that we don't learn from history. Um, I recorded a book about Napoleon uh, and the defeat that he suffered at the hands of the Russians when he was trying to take over Europe. And the Russians did what they've always done. You fight, then you retreat, then you fight, then you retreat, and you suck the defenders into your country, and then you let Mother Nature, uh, Mother Winter, take care of them. <laughs> and then, And then... I, apparently, 
um, Hitler never learned anything from history because he thought he could take the Russians on. And he started in the fall, just like Napoleon did. It's like, how dumb can you be? I mean, come on. Um, but and another thing that I learned is um, it's often the the lowest on the totem pole in society that pay the price for the decisions of their leaders. And that's, that's a disappointing and sobering thing, but it's true. It's, it's true. The leaders, you know, declare wars, but they don't send their sons. And, and that's disturbing to me. And it's something that we're kind of still doing. Yeah. It's, it's like you said, it doesn't seem that we learn from it. And, uh, we just keep repeating it over and over and over again to our own, our own detriment. Um, but, Hey, it's good. It's good to know what happened before. I'm always thinking like, okay, if we're going to repeat history, you know, who survived it, who, uh, who flourished through it, um, who did things the right way, who did God bless, uh, so that whenever the next, uh, I guess, uh, recycling of the historical pathway begins again (laughs) and and we, and and we destroy ourselves. In, in that same in that same vein of that same conversation, the, the flip side of the downside that I just brought to the fore is the impact that a single person can have on history. You know, you as a, as a human, as a Christian, as a man, as a woman, you can stand up and do what is right. And it's amazing how you can get people to follow who were like thinking all along, they just needed somebody to raise the standard. And so the little guy, often used and abused, can also be the the leader of tomorrow by standing up for what he believes in and doing what is right regardless of the cost. And so there's always that inspirational aspect to history too. I read a book by Mark Twain called Joan of Arc, you talk about a, a woman from history who was would not be cowed, would not relent, would not give up on what she believed God had for her to do and what an impact she's had on history. Washington, Lincoln, you know, all these people throughout history who stood up for what they believed in and um, did have, you know, they were they were people just like you and I. But they they stood for something bigger than themselves and and uh, changed the world because of it. Yeah, and I guess the human condition is you never know what the impact you have until till you're gone. So it's got to be for the kids and for the next generation. Yeah, you may never know. And I, you know, what I hope is from the books that I've chosen to record, the models that they present. I may not be personally influencing homeschooled dads and moms and kids, but the authors are speaking through me. And and my hope is that through the skills that God's given me, the talents that God's given me, I'm paying back to him with my talents in a manner that I think is pleasing to him and can have an eternal impact on on people's lives and that that is my motivation it's a business i want it to make money and it has for almost 25 years now i've been unbelievably um blessed mm, praise by the that. lord i know it's just, it's astounding to me i keep looking around going how is this happening i but mm. It, it does keep happening. And I'm just so, so, so grateful that um, Monica asked me that question. And that teacher complimented me in second grade. And, you know, people have said nice things about my recordings and, and buy them and tell other people. It's just, it's really, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, you, Monica and I were listening to a song yesterday. And one of the refrains was, everybody has a dream. And I looked at my wife and I said, you know what? I don't. I don't anymore. Mm. I am living my dream. I don't have any dreams anymore. <laughs> Everything <laughs> that I could possibly have wanted out of life, mm. I have gotten already. And and Jim Hodges audiobooks is really big part of that. Really big. Mm-hmm. The Lord certainly has blessed you and your ministry and the um, just the impact you've had on homeschooling families by making these uh, great stories available to us on audiobooks. 
Is there is there a particular recording that you think everyone should listen to that uh, maybe has life lessons in it that uh, might stand out, but not might not be the first one a parent would pick up? Uh, yes, there is. And it's not one of the Henty novels. It's another one that I recorded. A friend of mine, his name was Little Bear Wheeler. Um, he was a homeschool speaker, and uh, he's now a pastor in Texas. He wrote a book called God's Mighty Hand, Providential Occurrences in World History, where God intervened in the affairs of men through nature, through circumstances, through who knows what. Um, and that, that title was probably the most faith-building book I've read outside of Scripture itself, because I was familiar with a lot of the stories, particularly from American history, about just the unlikeliness of this happening and that happening and that happening, which resulted in Washington not getting shot or the army escaping from, from New York. And, you know, and it's the, the stories in that book are really uh, something to be considered. Um, whether you're a believer or not, you will be astounded at the stories in, in that book. And that really, that increased my faith a lot. God's, God's Mighty Hand, Providential Occurrences in World History. Really good stuff. And is there a book that you haven't recorded yet or may not be allowed to record because of copyright that you would really love to uh, be able to lend your voice to? Uh, somebody else asked me that too. And the one book that I would really like to record, but it is under copyright, is the Amplified Bible. I find it so helpful to have the, the expansion on the meaning of the passage or the phrase or the intent to kind of flesh out. Because sometimes scripture, particularly King James for me, uh, I was at a Bible study Wednesday night a couple of weeks ago, and I said, this one verse has always confused me my whole life. I've never understood this passage, this one, this one verse. And it took, you know, half an hour for us discussing it for me to finally figure out what, what, they, what Paul meant by that. Um, whereas the Amplified Bible, I think, just takes God's word and gently, and I believe accurately, um, expands on it in an everyday kind of language to translate what the author probably meant and we believe that the author meant. And that's one that I, I would love to read that out loud and it would take a long time. But yeah, that's that's one that I would probably record if, if copyright were no issue. You know, sometimes people say like politics is downstream of culture and then culture may be downstream of the church. You know, where does literature play in all that? And is uh, modern literature, is anything good coming out? Or, uh, you know, what do you see is the current state of, uh, you know, writing and uh, books uh, in today's uh, modern culture? Specifically, what's being written for middle school and high school and children is just plain, it's just garbage. I'm sorry. It's it's garbage. It's just so much piffle, I think, is a good word for it. Or twaddle, I think, was, uh, um, what's, what's uh, drawing her name? I'm drawing a blank on her name. Um, th there's, there's just so much worthless stuff. And when you compare it to what Henty was writing to middle schoolers in the middle of the 1800s, which is these Henty novels, to what's coming out today, I think it's, I think it's garbage. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think there is a I think there's an interplay between the two. I think more often than not, unfortunately, the literature is a reflection of the culture instead of instead of the leader of the culture. And and I think that is why most of what's coming out today is really just not worth. It's just not worth reading. There's no there's no challenge. There's nothing positive about them. It's either it's just goofy or stupid or otherworldly or or uh, immoral, and and um, I I I fear for the future of my country if this is what we're feeding our kids. Honestly, well, I think a lot of parents are, and that's why they've decided to homeschool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. If you so. if you want to get Charlotte Mason stuff, go to Classical Conversations. <laughs> I mean, that's that's where you're going to find good stuff for your kids, and you will you will be able to avoid 
the the piffle. I'm sorry. It's just terrible stuff out there. I don't take my grandkids to the library. No. No, unfortunately you can't can't anymore, or at least not without adult supervision to see what's yeah, in the right. child section. Right, right. No kidding. Now are you reading anything uh for yourself? Do you like to read novels, business books, the latest book on Bitcoin? Uh what does Jim read for pleasure? Uh for pleasure, you know, it's funny. I record historical fiction for work, and that was how I was introduced to the subject of history was through historical fiction. So I think it's a great segue into learning history. Um, if you got a good author who's done their research, you learn a lot of actual factual history through historical fiction. But in my uh, free time, when I'm when I pick up something to read, it is nonfiction history almost exclusively um, and or the next book that I hope to record. And right now I'm reading Black Beauty. So I think I'm going to I think I might be doing that next. It's a really delightful book. I, I've never read it before. And, you know, this job is great because I decided I wanted to start recording the classics, which I had never read before. <laughs> So, okay. um, uh, you know, I've done Swiss Family Robinson and Robinson Crusoe and Around the World in 80 Days. And, you know, I've done a lot of you know, autobiography of Frederick Douglass. Uh, I mean, I've read a lot of the classics now that that I had not read. And I did like six years worth of English and, and uh, literature when I was in high school. So how I never was had to, you know, assigned to read these books, I'll never know. But all of a sudden, I'm really, really enjoying the classics. Uh, my wife and I will often go down. We live in Annapolis and the, the Naval Academy grounds are a 10 minute drive from our house. And we'll just go down and sit by the water. And we'll often take a couple of um, beach chairs down there and sit under a lamp and, and read of an evening. And I, I the first one I read doing that was uh, Frankenstein, which I then immediately decided I would not record because I didn't really <laughs> like it. <laughs> um but uh, yeah, that got I got really interested in the classics, and I those are those are very very good. I'm, I'm really enjoying that as well as my you know I'm reading a by a big 400 page book on the life of Oliver Cromwell because I don't know he's interesting to me. He just is. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's the beauty. One of the beauties of owning your own business is uh, being able to choose what projects you do and what projects you don't do. Uh, right, once you get to that point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't be happier. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm having a great time. People seem to like what I do. It's providing a a reasonable standard of living. Um, Monica and I've been able to do a bit of traveling. So I've traveled to a number of the places that I've read about, and that's been really fascinating. Um, So uh, life's, life's good. Life's really good. Uh, two more questions to wrap it up. Uh, one, if someone's thinking about starting their own business, uh, you, do you have any advice for them? Um, you know, it sounds it sounds hokey, but it is true. If you can find something that you absolutely love to do and you're really good at it and you can figure out how to get people to pay you to do it, then you you are like set. You are set for life. Because to be able to do something that you love, and when you when you love to do something, more often than not, you get good at it because you love yeah. to do it. So you want to. So you practice and you try and you listen and you learn. Um, I love to read out loud, so it was just a natural fit for me to do this. And technologically, in the in the in 1999, I could record at a, at home. I could you know all of these things I could do, and so it's worked for me. The other best piece of advice I've ever heard um, is uh, it's not what you can sell the product for. It's what you paid for it. Yeah. (laughs) Therein lies your profit. The less you can pay for the base product, the better off you're going to be in the long run. So if it's a talent like me, so I bought software, I bought a microphone, I bought a preamp and a speaker. Um. That's a one-time expense. Everything mm-hmm. else is just me sitting in front of the microphone and recording. That costs me, it actually costs me nothing. So um, if I pay somebody to edit, okay. But the lower the cost of your product creation, 
and duplication, the more profitable you're going to be. Find something that you love to do. And, and honestly, we live in the United States of America in the 21st century. There's no better time nor place to make a living on your own, online, or, or anywhere else for that matter. You have been, you have been given, if you've been born in the United States, you've been given the golden ticket. And I, I <laughs> would strongly encourage you to, to pursue self-employment because I think that's the, the greatest uh, human happiness will come from being happy in your work and being happily married and having kids, obviously all those other things. But from a work perspective, um, being happy in your work is just really, really, really critical. And I am supremely, and it appears you are too. Yeah. The Lord's blessed us and we try to bless him back. Amen. All right. What's the website? Uh, of course, you can go through the Classical Conversations bookstore to purchase your material. But uh, what else can, how else can people connect with you? Um, I've spent thousands of dollars to come up with this web address. Because, actually, I spent absolutely <laughs> nothing. <laughs> My website is jimhodgesaudiobooks.com. I figured, yeah. you know what? put my name in there and what I'm doing. It started off being Henty tapes because Henty was the author and everything was on cassette tapes. And then I found out that most people were finding me by Googling my name. So I said, okay, let's change it. Jim Hodges, audiobooks.com. And on my homepage, you can click on a button and sign up for the email list and get a free download of uh, one of the Henty novels. Um, Because I believe in letting people listen to something before they buy. So if they want to, if they want to listen to one and see if it's going to work for them, that would be a great place to start. If you already know you like the stuff, go to Classical Conversations and get it there. I'm, I, I want, I want you to be successful too, Robert. So I want, I'm, I'd much rather steer people to your sites than than mine, quite honestly. Well, we appreciate that, Jim. Thank you so much for coming on today's show, and uh, check out Jim Hodges Audiobooks.com if you don't want to go to the Classical Conversations <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Robert. Very much appreciate it. I really enjoyed that Jim's favorite book is about the providence of God and how he's worked through history and how that really ties in with Jim's own life and uh, the providence of his teacher complimenting him and his wife asking a question about what he wants to do next. What I want you to do next is to share this episode with a friend and go check out an audiobook from classicalconversationsbooks.com so you too can learn about history and watch everyone else repeat it. Until next time, be sure to practice those 15 tools of learning. Thank you for listening to Refining Rhetoric with Robert Bordens. Want more? Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss an episode. You can also follow us on social media to continue the conversation and visit classicalconversations.com forward slash rhetoric to find out how you can join a local homeschool community.